Well, good morning again, and we want to turn our attention to the book of Acts this morning. And as you do that, uh, you will find these uh, little ballots at the end of your row. Usually we do this at the end of the service, and just sort of feel led to change that up a little bit. If you find these in your end of your row, just pass them down, and we'll take care of this in just a few minutes. Now, uh, as you are our guest this morning, maybe you're, this is your first time here, and uh, at the end of this service, in just a few moments, not the end, but kind of in the middle, we're going to be voting on uh, whether to take on um, a doing business as name, a DBA, onto our name. And many of you have already know about that. You've studied about that in your Sunday school or small group classes and also uh, the worship services as well. And so with that in mind, why, why the book of Acts? Why this? Well, this vote today, of course, is going to be an important vote. And it could, um, whether, wh- whether it goes one way or the other, we need to rekindle our fire with the Lord. Knowing that rekindle the heart for ministry to change our, really our tone, to reach out beyond ourselves with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I've been going over a little bit Vision 22. And our vision is based upon the Word of God. But this is the Word of God. And we need to study it to see what God has to say for us about the purpose and what's going on in the, in the church. Now, we've been in a series of messages all year long, different series on hope. And so the title of this series is The Community of Hope as we turn to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says in this central verse of the entire book of Acts, the central the- thematic verse says, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, this is the theme. Witnesses for Christ is the theme of the book. And the author, Luke, was not maybe looking at saying, what, what theme should I put, pick out for this book? Because this is his second book. The first one was the Gospel of Luke. And the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter Act, of the book of Acts, it says, the first account uh, I composed to Theophilus, a friend, a Roman friend of his that he was trying to lead to the Lord, and all that Jesus began to do and teach. He says, what I did in the book of, uh, book of Luke is go over the life of Jesus Christ, the history of what happened. And so really the theme of Luke, Luke is just simply, hey, I'm just telling the facts. I'm just telling you what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. Now in this second part of Luke's gospel, you might say. He's continuing that by saying, this is what the apostles, or really Jesus, did and taught through the apostles and through the disciples and through the early church. This is how it all began. So really, Luke's purpose is just to tell us the history of what has gone on. As we read this, the Holy Spirit certainly has given us the theme of being witnesses Uh, for the cause of Christ. We can divide this book up by saying the first seven chapters have to do with witnessing in Jerusalem and Judea. Chapters 8 through 12, witnesses in Samaria, and chapters 13 through 28 would be the witnesses in the uttermost parts of the world. And so our goal in this series is to look primarily really at the first 12 chapters and see about ourselves being the community of hope. Now, The idea is that we're passing our faith down. Being a witness for Christ is the heart of the ministry. And and the idea is, is that if you're in a relay race and Jesus is taking the first lap and he's holding out the baton and now the disciples reach back, reach back, I think it was with this arm. Is this right, Tom? The right arm? Okay, you reach back. And you take the baton, and the apostles were taking the baton and beginning to run. Now, all down through the centuries, every generation is running a new lap. And we're to take the baton and be witnesses for Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Acts is really all about. And so as we're looking at this, I remember the video that we looked at with Jimmy Scroggins, who is the pastor of the First Baptist Church of West Palm, that we'll look at that video once again here in just a few minutes. But he was talking about, one of the things that really captured me by his testimony was that he said, when they changed the name of the church, it took on a new tone, a whole new tone. And that's what was happening in the book of Acts. Before, it was just the Jewish people. 
But beginning particularly in Acts chapter 10, all of a sudden as the gospel was preached to Cornelius, it became the gospel for the Gentiles as well. It took on a whole new tone of ministry that everyone needed to have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Lord. So we look at this outline this morning, and it's very simple. First of all, we, the witness of, the message, a witness from, the means, and then finally a witness toward, and that is the motive. And so let's look at the message, first of all, the witness of. What are we to be witnesses of? Verse 2, it says, until he do, whatever he did, began to do and teach, verse 2, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had been by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. What were these orders? Well, first of all, he said in verse 3, he says, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So get the picture of what's going on here. Jesus Christ has died. He was buried. He rose again, and that's the heart of the gospel. And now for 40 days, he's spending time with the disciples, the Bible says, with convincing proofs. Now, what kind of proofs what were they talking about? Well, the proofs were he did not necessarily spend every waking hour of those 40 days, but he kept appearing to them, teaching the kingdom of God. And so they saw him. At one point, he walked through a wall without a door. That's pretty convincing. I don't care who you are. You know what I'm saying? And so the Spirit of God was working in a powerful way to convince them. Now, this word, convincing, means that it's overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive proof that Jesus was alive. Some people feel like that the disciples wanted to believe in the resurrection, and therefore they made up something in order to believe the resurrection of Christ. But that's not true. In fact, the opposite, if you read the Bible and a little bit of history as well, the disciples did not believe that. They were, the idea is here is that he, he uh, appeared to them with convincing proofs that this was history, that these were the facts. Now, why do I bring this out in, in such a way? Because the gospel is based upon facts. It's not based upon conjecture. It's not based upon wishful thinking. It's based upon history. It is based upon historical facts. Somebody come along and say, well, I guess the big question in my my life is, is Christianity working for me? Is it working for you? Well, if it's in your testimony, if it's working for you, maybe it'll work for me. Maybe it'll be, make me more fulfilling. Maybe it'll give me peace. Maybe it'll give me hope in life. Well, all these things are true, but that's not the question. The question is, is it true? That's the question. Because if it is true, then all those other things are going to come. But the question you've got to ask yourself with eternity on the line for you and for others, is the gospel true? And according to the Scriptures and according to what we read other than the Scriptures, it is among these convincing proofs that the evidence, the greatest evidence of Christianity of all, is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This is the gospel. You know, people say, well, what is the gospel? Well, again, as I read on Easter Sunday... 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered to you, as first importance, Paul says, what I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and he was, he was buried, and he raised uh, on the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's, that's it. He died, he was buried, he rose again. That is the gospel. Now, people say, well, you can't. You know, these churches are just watering down the gospel. Really, they're not watering down the gospel. Because if you water down the gospel, you don't have the gospel anymore. You just don't have it. The gospel is based upon true fact. It is true, and therefore we have to respond to that truth. And because of that, the disciples knew, since it was true, not only did it work, but it was true, that they had to take that message to the multitudes, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even into the uttermost parts of the world. Our vision statement is sharing the love of Christ by reaching, teaching, serving, sending, people throughout the world so the sun will never set on the ministry of First Baptist Church of Oviedo. That's just simply 
a unique way, a different, when I say unique, not maybe unique to our entire church, you know, church body all throughout Christendom, but it's our way of expressing what we're about with the great commission of reaching people for Christ and training them up to send them out and to be servants for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, receiving the baton, as we need to do, means we're taking the gospel that is fact, that is true, that heaven and hell are on the line, and we take that and run and reach our generation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see the witness of. Now, what about the witness from? What about the means? Look in verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father who had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. Now, he's already gone over this before. That's what he's saying. And you can read the Gospels, and you can read even the overlap of Luke and understand that he's already shared this with them. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, when we look at the Bible, we, uh, uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but you will, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, meaning Jesus Christ. So this is a fulfillment of what John the Baptist had already said. Now, understand, it says baptize. This word baptize simply means to immerse. And so we've made that word out to be some ceremonial thing that we do in church, and most all denominations do that in one form or another. But in the original Greek language, it simply means to immerse or to dip, to totally overwhelm, to totally surround. And so he's saying here that as John baptized with water, totally immersed in the water, God is going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit of God, and that's how you're going to receive power according to verse 8. And we look at this, we understand that as the Holy Spirit was moving through them on the day of Pentecost, they became different on the inside. Now, you and I receive the Holy Spirit the very moment that we are saved. I believe with all my heart that we are immersed in the Holy Spirit at that time because of what the Scripture teaches. And that's a different message altogether. But you and I receive the power, the application the immersion, the total overwhelming of the Spirit of God daily as we walk with Him. And when we walk with Him, certain things come into our life with this power. Let me give you four things real quickly. First of all, there's a deep conviction for, about the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says this, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the, in the Holy Spirit with full conviction conviction that eternity is on the line, that we are lost, that Christ is the only way to heaven, that we are to be witnesses for him. There's a conviction that the word of God is true. But then there's a courage and boldness to speak. Listen to Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled, kind of the same idea, filled with the Holy Spirit, and begin to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, you and I cannot pretend to really be immersed in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, without having a burden for lost people around us. And when you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not going to have that kind of boldness. I remember a, a trip that we, uh, a couple of guys and I took to Romania. And uh, we had to go by way through, through Paris. And as we were... Uh, there in Paris, we had to get on this bus that took us around, took us about maybe 45 minutes to get to our terminal, very large airport if you've ever been there. And so on this bus, this young lady got on, and I, I don't know what was wrong. I don't know whether there was a, uh, some drug problem, not, not drugs as a, addiction, but just something she took. Maybe she was, had drank, drank something, but she was just really incoherent almost. Her dad had died. She had come to... Um, she was going to go to, I believe, Brussels in order to, uh, to bury him. And we had just gotten off the plane, no sleep at all. I wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, really. Uh, I, I mean, the two guys I was with, I mean, I wasn't in the mood to talk to them. They're, my breath was terrible. Their breath was terrible. You know, when I talked, I went like this, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't want to talk to anybody. But God moved in my heart to go over and talk to that young lady. 
and I didn't. I didn't. And I felt so convicted about that. I said, well, God, you know, I talk to everybody about the Lord all the time. You know, I just, I, I can't, I don't even know if I can think. I had all kinds of excuses. She sat right in front of me on the plane. And then, when got off, there she was at the luggage. And finally, I did speak to her at that point. I prayed with her, but the, I, the, whole, the whole opportunity to witness was just simply gone. See, when we're not walking in the Spirit... We don't have that boldness. We don't have that clarity of what our purpose is really all about. And you say, yeah, but pastor, I just can't witness. You know, people, I I just don't like the rejection. It's harder. It's harder when you get the rejection. I challenged some of you, uh, many of you as leaders uh, a few weeks ago, that if you have any question about this whole name change thing, I challenge you to go invite five people uh, to church that don't normally come to church. Invite them to this one. And uh, evidently, maybe somebody took me up on it. Somebody out from EOC, never had knocked on doors before, decided to go across the street, knocked on a door across the street from where EOC is meeting, uh, our East Orlando campus, and began to explain to them about coming that Sunday to our satellite church or that campus. And they were very receptive. They're at the door just talking, very receptive. And they said, what does EOC, now this is a true story. Happened 10 days ago or less. And they ask, what does EOC stand for? And the, the answer was, well, we are the East Orlando campus, the first Baptist church of Oviedo. And the lady heard Baptist, said, Baptist, hold it right there. You've said enough. I know all about you. And shut the door. Now, that's tragic. But what's even more tragic about it is when she went back and told someone about it, and, and sort of feels like maybe she needs to get involved in another type of ministry altogether. Let me tell you something. When you're, you're out there and you're inviting people to church and people, and you feel like you're at a handicap, it's going to be more difficult for you to be bold in the Lord. But there's a courage. Then there's a selfless witness and ministry. It says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men so that I may may win some, by all means win some. In other words, no longer do you have a consumer type of mentality. What's in it for me in the church? But rather, you look outside of yourself knowing that there's more to life than ourselves. And we're reaching out and we're doing the things selfishly. Finally, you're going to be an effective witness as well. It says, do not know, do you not know uh, those who run the race Run to win, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Well, there is power. There is effectiveness that comes from it. I remember pastoring another church, and I was becoming a little, uh, not discouraged, but distraught a little bit. There was just, we weren't bearing any fruit in the last month or so. So I said, God, you know, I look at my own witness, and I haven't led anybody to the Lord in the last month or so. And what do I do? And I saw this book on my shelf, and so I pulled it off. I'd, I'd had it for a long time. Somebody had given it to me years before. And it was a very popular way of sharing the gospel. And so I, uh, I opened it up, and I, I memorized it. I, I got so involved in it, I read the whole book and memorized the presentation as much as I could. But I wasn't ready to use it. I, wasn't, I just didn't know it. I didn't know that outline. I didn't know some of those verses. And so I said, uh, you know, I'm going to study this all week. But that night was visitation night, that Monday night. I went out visiting, and I visited a relative of someone that had recently, in the last six months, been been saved. And so I went to that house. There were five people there, five adults, plus children, but five adults. And we began to talk. And I couldn't pull out my my little booklet, my track, because not everybody could see it. So I just jumped in, and I used that presentation. And God just recalled it to my memory. All five of those people received Jesus Christ in their heart. Not only that, they were baptized in our church and became very involved in our church as well. So God does make us effective witnesses when we're filled with the Spirit. But then, I want us to see lastly this morning, a witness toward what what is the motive here? Look with me in verse 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him 
out of their sight. This is the ascension of the Lord. Jesus has been on earth now for 40 days, and now he's ascending, and a cloud's taking him up, and they are sitting there staring at what was happening as Jesus was going. And you say, well, that's, that's all fine and good to know, but what does all that mean? It means plenty. It means a lot. What does it show us? I've just got time this morning very quickly to show you three things. First of all, the ascension shows us that God operates from the cross and the theology, the doctrine of the cross. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1. It says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. What's he talking about here? It's saying that Jesus now has ascended up into heaven, and it says that other places he makes intercession for us, but right now he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and everything is in subjection under his feet. He is the sovereign ruler of all. Now, with that being said, you ask yourself the question, yeah, but what about all the bad things that are still happening? What about all the suffering in the world? What did I just say? The ascension shows us that he operates from the cross. How does he do that? Well, when, the, when Jesus died on the cross, everybody that looked at what was going on said, this is a bad thing. If you were there on the day that Jesus Christ had died, died on the cross and hung on a cross, you would have said, this is horrible. You'd have been, you and I would have been crying and saying, oh, it, it's all gone. It's all over. But God used the evil to bring about the good. And he was buried, and the third day he rose from the dead to conquer sin and to conquer death for us. He uses that same doctrine from heaven today. He takes the evil of our life and brings about good from it. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The Bible says that God operates from the center of the cross and leading people to, to the place where God, leading people to the cross will take them to a place where God replaces or uses the evil and brings about good. He turns evil on itself from the cross. Then we find God operates bringing people to mercy through the justice of God. Hebrews 7 verses 25 through 27 talk about this. All of us need affirmation in life. All of us do. My little um, granddaughter came to visit us last uh, Sunday night, and uh, she just copies. You know, she's two years old. She copies everything everybody else does. And, and we were, you know, clapping for her when she did something. And you have children and grandchildren. You know if you clap for them, they, you know, they smile and everything. But she, she gave it one of these. Every time we clapped for her, she'd smile and go. I don't know where she got that. But everybody wants affirmation. The cross gives us affirmation because Jesus Christ has forgiven us of every single sin we have ever committed from the cross and bring about justice through where he is today, sitting on the throne of justice through this mercy. And finally, we operate from a future hope. Look in verse 10 and 11. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in a white clothing stood beside them, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. One day he's coming again. And dear friend, all of us ought to look forward to that coming. If we love Jesus, we need to look forward to his coming the way we look forward to our children and grandchildren coming to visit us because we love them. And time is short. Eternity is long. Acts brings us a revelation of a new day, a new tone. Jesus said, I will, he told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. One of the things, again, I like about Jimmy Scroggins' video, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of West Palm, now called the, the Family Church, is it sets a new tone. Let's, let's watch that video one more time before we close the service. 
Hi, I'm Jimmy Scroggins, and I'm the lead pastor of Family Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. My friend, Pastor Dwayne, asked me to tell you a little bit about our story as you consider making some changes to the ways you go about sharing the love of Jesus in Oviedo. You are a church on a mission just like us. It's a mission that we always have to keep before us. If we don't, then we can make church about something other than our mission. It can become a place to get our list of do's and don'ts. It can become a type of group therapy where people hope to leave feeling a little bit better than they did when they came. Or it can turn into another self-help venue on our quest to get our best life now. These can all be great side benefits of being part of the church, but they're not our primary mission. Our mission given to us by Jesus himself is to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm privileged to serve as the pastor of a church with a long history of doing whatever it takes to reach our community with the gospel of Jesus. We've been making disciples here since 1901. Originally founded as the First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach, we started with just a few people meeting in a small home. We moved from that home to the city's library and then to several other locations before landing on our current property. We built a permanent church facility and kept adding on to it throughout the 1990s. Our strategy was to build it so they would come. And it worked for a season. When I came to pastor First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach, there was already a sense that God was doing something new. The people of First Baptist recognized that the changing landscape of our city, our county, our state, and honestly, our whole country demands a different approach. We determined that we needed to shift our methods if we were going to continue our legacy of doing whatever it takes to reach the lost. So that's what we've done. We've changed the method, not the message. We live in a county of 1.4 million people and 95% of them don't go to church anywhere. We are going to do whatever it takes to reach them. In 2008, we were in one location in one language, but now we're one church in seven locations in two languages. We are a multi-campus, multicultural, and multi-generational church. We no longer expect people who are unchurched and irreligious to come to us. They just aren't going to do it. We need to reach out to them. We need to go and make disciples. This is primarily why we've changed our name from the First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach to Family Church. We believe the name Family Church builds a bridge and tears down an artificial barrier. Let's face it, the Baptist label has high negatives. We aren't known for being multicultural or for accepting all kinds of people. Why hold on to a name if it builds a barrier that people don't want to cross? We want to build bridges that people can cross so that they will hear the good news that Jesus died for sinners like them and like you and like me. Changing our name did not change who we are, but it definitely changed our tone. It made our church feel more inviting to guests. It energized our attenders to invite their friends and generally made us more appealing to people in our community. Every month at our new members class, we have people say, oh, this is a Baptist church? I probably wouldn't have come if I'd have known that. But they did come and they heard and now they are ready to join the mission. They're ready to do whatever it takes to tell their friends about Jesus and family church and they're comfortable doing it. We haven't changed who we are or what we believe. We still adhere to the Baptist faith and message. We still network with the Southern Baptist Convention, the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board, Southern Seminary, Southeastern Seminary, and many other great Baptist churches. We don't expect people to clean up and then come to Jesus. We want them to come to Jesus and let him change them. So that's our story. And I for one can't wait to see what God is going to do in the coming months and years as we continue his mission of making disciples. Now, I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do, but I will say this, the First Baptist Church of Oviedo matters. You are one of the leading churches in our state, perhaps even in our country. Yours is already a miracle story. You have done what it takes to reach people in and around Oviedo. You're putting the needs of lost people ahead of your own personal comfort. But doesn't God want you to keep going? Could you change your methods without compromising your message? I believe that you can, and I believe you should, because the mission and the message are bigger than we are. We all have to be willing to do whatever it takes to go make disciples of all people. 
Hey, thanks for listening. And please know that we're praying with you and we're pulling for you from West Palm Beach. All right, amen. And so uh, I think that uh, we've attempted to a- answer um, uh, your, your questions, certainly the questions I would have on something like this. We've gone over and over this. So let me just leave a couple of thoughts with you as um, we take our ballots here in just a few moments. And Bill Carthen comes in just a minute to, uh, to make the motion. But what we're trying to do here is, uh, is to build bridges and not to build and take down some barriers. It will be an isolated change. Um, you know, I, I'm telling you, you know, from my heart, you, you know, it's up to you whether you're going to believe it or not, but I, I, again, haven't lied to you in 22 years. This is isolated change. No changes are going to take place, whether, you know, based on a name change, yes or no vote. And then, um, hey, you know, if the vote comes out no, we're going to keep plowing ahead. We are. We're just going to keep going, keep plowing ahead. The ground's just going to be harder than, than softer. That's all. And so, um, I had a friend of mine that works for the denomination call me and said, uh, how's that going and all that. And he's, he's, uh, he under- he's perfectly understanding, is uh, probably for it, even though he can't state that, and I can't state his name, I guess. Um, but um, he just said, you know, uh, in our church, back, and he, he mentioned the church, I know which one it was, very great church. He said, we always had three things on every ballot. Yes, if you prayed about it and you've you really know what God wants you to do. No, you prayed about it, and God, you know what God wants you to do. Or, uh, I don't know, but I do trust the leadership of the church. And so, we don't have that on here, just yes or no. But let me just share with you, if you uh, have prayed about it, and uh, God has told you that this is a mistake, we should not be doing this, then you are obligated to vote no. You, you really are, and I I would uh, fight for your right to do that. Um, at the same time, if you don't know, you can sit it out, you know, and just not vote, or you can take a challenge here and trust the leadership. And without that, you really don't have much unity going on in the church anyway. But rather than just my leadership, let me just say that we had nine people on the task force, including Bill, that's going to be coming in just a moment. Nine people, that's ten altogether. You have, uh, I can't pretend to uh, speak for all the deacons here, just the ones that were at the meeting, we'll say the 40 or so that came to the meeting, um, the meetings, and uh, they were, seemed to be all in, and so that brings you up to about 50 people. And then the staff, another dozen or so, maybe more, and uh, now we're up in the low 60s. And none of those people that have studied what we're, going, what we're about to do uh, feel anything but positive about what's going on. And so I'm really not asking you to trust the leadership of one person. I'm asking you to trust the leadership, the judgment, and the fact that we've prayed through it uh, through about 60-something people. And if you're waiting for the time that God's going to make you comfortable with it without really getting down and praying with an open mind, open heart, it's going to take months to get there. Believe me, I know. But if you were to sit down and really pray about it, I really feel like God would speak to your heart one way or the other very quickly. And that's the reason why um, there's only, I guess, been two weeks. And if I had to go over again, I, I would say that I would say the only thing I would change about this whole process, I would probably give you another couple of weeks to pray about it. But at the same time, I really believe that, you know, if you were to really get down, fast, pray, whatever you needed to do, God would have spoken to your heart about it. And so that's my challenge to you today, all right? And with that, I'm going to ask Bill Carthen. Uh, to come, and uh, Bill, you have a mic, Thank, thanks, great, and uh, make the motion for us this morning, and then we will pray. Good morning. Good morning. We have a great vision in this church. It is sharing the love of Christ by reaching, teaching, s- serving, and sending people throughout the world so that the sun will never set on the ministry of the First Baptist Oviedo. Since last fall, I've been a part of a task force that represents a broad cross-section of this church. We've worked on a project to help us fill that vision. After careful study, much prayer, it is our unanimous recommendation that we adopt a new name for our church so that we may reach our community and beyond for Christ. 
On behalf of the task force, I move that we receive our recommendation to develop a new church name under a doing business as name while maintaining our existing legal name of First Baptist Church of Oviedo, Incorporated. All right. Thank you, Bill. And since this has not come from an official committee, does, it does need a second. Do I have a second? All right. It's been seconded. All right. Now, I want you to take your ballot because we want to look at these because there's no place on here for a name. And we've done that before, and we didn't want to, uh, you know, maybe that's a little intimidating, so we left it off this time. So you are on your honor, okay? Vote one time. You know, this is not a general presidential election. You know, you vote once, all right? <laughs> and uh, we got the Bible verse up here at the top. And uh, recommending yes or no vote, are you a member? And that's where we also need your honor. Now, a member is someone that has been saved. You've been baptized um, by immersion, and you've gone through our membership class, okay? If you have not met all those criteria, legally, you're, you're not a member, but we still want to know your input for the total, uh, to total vote. But legally, we need that. Are you a member, yes or no? And then if your recommendation is yes on the flip side, in fact, if your recommendation is no, you still can make a suggestion. You know, we're not saying that you can't. But... Um, some name suggestion guidelines, multi-generational, it's not trendy, travels well because we have more than one campus. And again, if we, if we don't change the name totally, we're still going to have to do something there. Uh, not already used in the local area, and maybe you don't know that, but we'll check that out if you don't. And preferably reflects the vision of the ministry of our church and name suggestions there. And so with that, let's bow in a word of prayer, then we're going let to you, let you vote. God, thank you so much for all that you've given us. And we pray right now, God, that you would speak to our heart in a very special way. And God, I pray that you would move upon us, give us peace about what we need to do. And for those, of Lord, that do not know, they just don't know, I do pray that they would not just sit the, the vote out, but I pray they would, they would trust us in our, in our leadership. And so with that, Lord, I pray that it's in your hands, and you're going to do what you're going to do. And I pray that sovereignly you will overcome everything and you will get your way in this vote and in this church in jesus name amen